ICCIT uh, seminar series on uh, AI for IA, artificial intelligence for intelligence analysis. Uh, is part of the, the center, the intelligence community uh, center for academic excellence. Uh, Director Ava Majelassi couldn't be here today, uh, but she recorded a very nice uh, video clip, three minutes, uh, for introducing the center and the lecture series. I'm going to play this. Watch. Good afternoon. My name is Ava Majlesi, and I oversee the Rutgers Intelligence Community Center for Academic Excellence, otherwise known as the ICCAE program, a consortium that includes faculty and students from Rutgers University, City College of New York, Borough of Manhattan Community College, and New Jersey City University. Welcome and thank you for joining us for our series on artificial intelligence for Intelligence Analysis, hosted by City College of New York. The purpose of this series is to make connections between technologies and applications and to enhance awareness of the importance of artificial intelligence in national security contexts. The speakers in this series are active researchers and practitioners in using AI, data analytics, and machine learning techniques in defense, intelligence, and security applications. Before we get started, I'd like to thank the Office of the Director of National Intelligence for supporting our students through the ICCAE program. Through this program, the federal government provides grants to public universities to enhance the recruitment and retention of a diverse intelligence community workforce with capabilities critical to the national security interests of the United States. For the students in our audience today, the intelligence community has an interest in a future workforce with advanced technology skills. I would really like to encourage all of our student participants today to become more involved with the ICCAE program, especially if they're considering a career in the intelligence community. I think what you'll find is that you already have many of the skills necessary for a career in this field and our team can open your eyes to a lot of the professional development opportunities available to help propel you into intelligence careers. You can learn more by visiting our website at intel.rutgers.edu. Now, on to today's topic. Why are we discussing artificial intelligence in a national security context? AI plays an increasingly important role in almost all aspects of homeland security. Today's talk will provide our audience with examples of homeland security challenges, dealing with keeping sports and entertainment arenas and stadiums safe, protecting our supply chains, and preparing for and responding to disasters, and describe ways in which AI is already relevant or might be. Before I turn it over to Dr. Chu, I'd just like to thank Dr. Fred Roberts for taking the time to share his insights with us today. I'm so sorry I can't be there live today, but Dr. Roberts, you've been a fantastic colleague and a mentor to me on so many occasions. You have always generously shared your knowledge and wisdom with me, and I can't thank you enough for that. Dr. Chu, I'll turn it back to you to introduce our friend and our colleague, Dr. Fred Roberts. Uh, I'd like to thank Ava for the very nice introduction. I hope everybody got motivated already uh, even before the talk. So now I'm going to uh, very happy to uh, have uh, Dr. Fred Roberts to come here to give the talk. Uh, Fred Roberts is a distinguished professor of uh, mathematics at Rutgers University and the director of Sakata, uh, which is uh, the center uh, command control and the uh, interoperability center for advanced data analysis, uh, which was founded as a department of Homeland Security uh, Center for Academic Excellence, COE. Uh, I was actually there uh, in 2017. That is uh, where I started my uh, current research on the smart at, at the accessible transporting hub, to involved into a large project with multiple universities, including Rutgers. Uh, City College, electrical field, and the industry collaborations. Uh, 
And so for Fred, 16 years, he directed the DIMIC, uh, the D -I -M -I -I -C -S, the Center for Discrete Math and the Theoretical Computer Science, uh, which is founded as a, a original uh, National Science Foundation uh, Science at the Technology Center. Uh, the, the S -C. He's the director in emeritus uh, and the senior advisor to the center. Now, uh, Dr. Robert is the author of four books, editor of 25 other books, and uh, over uh, 200 scientific articles. He's recently edited the book, he includes the first book on maritime cybersecurity in 2017, a 2019 book on mathematics of planet Earth, a 2021 book on resilience in the digital age. Uh, his work has been translated into Russian and Chinese and deal with such a variety of topics as decision-making, measurement, uh, epidemiology, uh, sustainability, large venue security, supply chain resilience, uh, disaster and pandemics, maritime security, uh, cyber security, global environmental change, socially responsible, uh, responsible algorithms, uh, mass psychology, uh, discrete mass, and uh, pre-college education. Uh, his recent contribution includes the best practices for stadium uh, security widely used by the NFL, NBA, NHL, and the Major League Baseball. And also a groundbreaking simulation of the world's busiest uh, bus terminal in New York Authority. I believe this is the Port Authority bus terminal, right? Uh, automated tools to help TSS uh, adjudicate applications from aviation workers with a criminal record. Uh, he leads the DHS COE wide initiative on supply chains during the COVID-19, including the distribution of vaccines, PPE, and food. And the current leads several research projects on very complicated disruption, uh, disruptions of supply chains. Uh, Dr. Robert has received the commemorate uh, Mandel of the Union of Czech Mathematicians and the Physicists uh, and the Distinguished Service Award of the Association of the Computational, uh, of the Computation Machinery, ICM, uh, Special Interest Group of Algorithms at the Computation Theory. Uh, he's a fellow of the American Mathematical Society uh, and received the National Science Foundation and Science and Technology Centers Pioneer Award. Uh, he also was awarded uh, the title of, uh, I don't know how to write that, Duta Honoris Cota Hosa by the University of Paris, Dauphin. Uh, with this, I will give the floor to uh, Fred, please. So by the way, before this, I just want to give one quick reminder. Everybody, if you have questions, uh, just uh, send your question to the chat. I'm, I'm going to correct that. So after the talk, uh, Ms. Jingcheng will be monitoring mm -hmm. the question answer session uh, for all the questions that you guys ask about anything about the career, uh, intelligence, security, and also how to learn it well, you know, to, to be successful, successful in your future. Okay. So with this, right? Uh, uh, first of all, thank you very much for that uh, terrific introduction. And I really appreciate uh, all my interactions with the center and all of the folks uh, involved with it. Uh, many of us have been involved in a variety of projects together uh, and uh, looking forward to continue those collaborations. So, what I want to do today is tell you a little bit about my own experiences with AI and Homeland Security. And I'll, I'll start by telling you a little bit about how I got involved in Homeland Security and how I got involved with some of the AI applications. And I'm going to try to cover a lot of topics just to get some discussion going. I'd be happy to follow up with answering your questions and uh, engaging in a dialogue uh, at, at any time. So, uh, you know, many of us start with our bachelor's degree. It may even be worth uh, going back to when I was in high school, uh, when uh, we woke up one morning and there was an earth circling satellite known as Sputnik. It was quite a shock to um, 
Americans to see that we were not the first in space. And this actually affected uh, my life in various degrees because uh, those of us who were in high school in those days were kind of pushed into the mathematical sciences uh, and the STEM disciplines. Uh, I was probably going that direction anyway, uh, but that, that was certainly uh, an impetus. Uh, I was a, a math student at Dartmouth and a PhD student at Stanford. And, but I was always interested in it, mostly in the applications. And in fact, I got interested in rather crazy things. So I was interested in mathematical psychology at M till this day. And so when I finished my PhD, I went to a psychology department at University of Pennsylvania, partly to understand what psychologists were talking about and the language they were using and, and, and so on. I had my first real job at the Rand Corporation. Uh, that was a think tank. It was originally an Air Force uh, a creation, but at the time I got there, it was broadening its scope and starting to work on energy and the use of energy and the problems with energy, air pollution and transportation systems and so on. So I went on to another postdoc again in the social sciences. And then I went to Rutgers and I've been at Rutgers now for 50 years uh, as a professor of mathematics. But that's a little bit of what I do, but it doesn't tell the whole story. So let me take you back to 1988 when uh, the US announced a nationwide competition for what they call science and technology centers. Uh, this was a big deal. Uh, the only rules were that you had to have a proposal that covered cutting edge science. It had to have some education and technology transfer components to it. And it had to be a partnership among academia, industry, and government. Uh, there were over 800 pre-proposals for this first round of National Science Foundation Science and Technology Centers. And lo and behold, we were one of the 11 winners. Uh, Rutgers was the lead institution. Princeton was a partner. Our industrial partners were Bell Labs and Bellcor, and we partnered with the New Jersey Commission on Science and Technology. And we created something called DIMAX, the Center for Discrete Mathematics and Theoretical Computer Science. So I directed DIMAX for 16 years, uh, and then recently did it again for a, a year as an interim director. Uh, DIMAX originally started with communications and computing and the role of math and computer science in those areas. But I think uh, it's important to say that because of my broad interests, uh, DIMAX uh, got broadened into molecular biology and the social sciences and data science. And of course, uh, and subject to what we're going to talk about today, artificial intelligence and machine learning, as well as many other things. So one of the things that DIMAX did was it planned multi-year uh, programs with workshops and tutorials and research working groups and things of that sort. And in 2001, we had planned a multi-year research program on uh, mathematical and computational epidemiology. And we were just about ready to go with that program. And this is how sometimes your life changes. The World Trade Center was attacked. And uh, at the same time, there were the anthrax attacks, the little uh, white powder envelopes with anthrax appearing in various places. Uh, the intelligence community was interested in getting help from those of us in academics who might be doing relevant work. And I think because if we were working on epidemiology, we got invited to a meeting with others who had large NSF funding, projects that might be relevant. And of course, ours was on epidemiology. Well, this is how you, your work and your life takes strange 
twists. They never did get very interested in what we were doing with epidemiology, although I'm still interested myself. Uh, we ended up working with the intelligence community on natural language processing. And we did that over quite a few years, uh, working on problems like, uh, were these two documents authored by the same person? Going all the way back in the history of natural language processing to the question of who authored the Federalist Papers, whether it was Hamilton or Madison. So that's how I got into Homeland Security, because in 2002, after the World Trade Center attacks, the Department of Homeland Security was formed. And they formed because they wanted connections to universities, the DHS Office of University Programs, and they created a network of university centers of excellence. Uh, we joined with Princeton and other universities in New Jersey to enter the competition for a first uh, DHS Center of Excellence. Uh, we didn't succeed in that first competition, but we did in 2006, and we became the Center for Dynamic Data Analysis because DHS was very interested in data science. And we won our second and continuing Center of Excellence excellence in 2009, and that was the Cicada Center. And I should mention, and I'll tell you a little more about this in a little while, starting uh, in the fall of 21, we became part of another DHS Center of Excellence called Century, and uh, we will uh, learn more about Century in a few minutes. So what's Cicada? So Cicada is the Command Control and Interoperability Center for Advanced Data Analysis. Uh, it's a mouthful. And those of you who know how to spell will, not, will see that we misspelled Cicada. The Cicadas don't have two Cs at the beginning. It was a very good way to immediately appear number one if somebody did a Google search, because it was the only place that spelled Cicada that way. The center has multiple university and company partners. It's based at Rutgers City College happens to be a partner. And uh, we basically are involved with developing analytical tools to protect against natural and man-made threats. So what I'm going to do today, now that I've told you a little bit about how I got here to where I am and what I'm doing, I want to introduce you to some of the work of Cicada uh, very quickly, and then go into more details in three directions that Ava already mentioned in her introduction. Stadium security and large venue security, supply chains, and disaster preparedness and response. So just so we have a working definition, because I want to emphasize the role of artificial intelligence in Homeland Security. I'll, I'll speak of AI as the, the simulation of human intelligence processes by machines, especially computer systems. And I'll distinguish it from machine learning, uh, where the, the latter is a class of AI algorithms that works by training a machine to learn, and then using that, tra uh, uh, using that learning on training data to get uh, to test things out on test data and, of course, to constantly improve. A lot of people don't distinguish between AI and machine learning. I'll, sometimes I'll be sloppy. But also, more generally, both of these fall in the general category of how to use massive amounts of data and how to uh, deal with automated and semi-automated processes and so on. And I'll talk about all those things. So. Let me first say that in stadium security, we've worked with all major sports leagues and many stadiums and arenas. It started with the National Football League and evacuation planning, and I'll get more details as we progress. But right now, first, uh, just a general overview. Uh, we've done a lot of work at Cicada on maritime cybersecurity. Uh, we organized at Rutgers the first ever tutorial and symposium on that topic 
who happened to be when, uh, in joint with the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard used that occasion to roll out their cyber security strategy. So we've collaborated with the Coast Guard on maritime cybersecurity research. And that led me to co-edit a book, co-edit a book with a Coast Guard uh, researcher named Joe Dorenzo on issues in maritime cybersecurity. I think it was the first book ever on that topic. That's also led me to NATO, to a meeting on maritime cybersecurity where they invited me to give a plenary talk. And so maritime cyber has been an important thing for us at Cicada. Uh, more recently, we got into working with the TSA and there we worked on the many applications to work at airports or to go through airports if you're a passenger, but most the emphasis was on airport workers. And how you tell if somebody makes an application whether they uh, pass the test of not having committed one of the disqualifying crimes. Uh, that required using Rutgers Law students and computer science students together to look at the rap sheets that we got from the FBI and seeing if those rap sheets matched up against one of the disqualifying crimes. It's not as easy as it sounds because every state has a different criminal code and uses different languages of one sort or another. And so you have to match that up against the, the, the disqualifying crimes. And that led to an automated system that does that job. So we've also gotten into supply chains. I'll have more on that later. Uh, we worked on uh, supply chains with an emphasis on COVID and the shortages of masks and ventilators and even the shortages we're seeing now. Uh, and that work has connected us up with many components of the Homeland Security enterprise, including uh, FEMA and Customs and Border Protection and uh, the DHS chief medical officer, as well as uh, health and human services and the agriculture department. It's amazing how many different government agencies are involved in the supply chain. Uh, we have also worked on information sharing. Uh, the 9-11 Commission, which reported and made recommendations after the World Trade Center attacks, one of their major recommendations was to enhance information sharing. Uh, and we had a project funded by the Office of the Director of National Intelligence to develop properties of an effective information sharing environment. Uh, those are two kinds of properties. They're the technical ones like interoperability, but then there are the trust issues, which is the human, not a, uh, a technological issue for the most part. So we also worked on the, the increasing importance of digital evidence when it comes to law enforcement. Uh, we worked on uh, computer enabled crimes and in particular on training people to deal with evidence that might come from smartphones and tablets and cloud storage and even from computers and cars and things of that sort. There is an organization called the Federal Law Enforcement Training Centers uh, which uh, takes law enforcement people from all over the country, brings them in and trains them in different directions. Clearly, digital evidence is a major area that is growing. And uh, we uh, have been working on that for a number of years and are now working with the New Jersey court system to figure out how to train uh, court workers. Uh, another thing we've done is work with the Coast Guard on fisheries. So uh, the Coast Guard uh, is, uh, charged with enforcing the fisheries regulations. So it's things like, where can I um, fish at what season? And what kinds of fish can I get? And so on. Uh, they had developed a scoring system called Optide that uh, scored a fishing vessel and 
help them decide whether uh, they should board it to find the violation. They were finding about 20% success rate uh, when they did that. And uh, we developed something using machine learning that we called Riptide. And Riptide uses new features of one kind or, or another. And, and through, after much experimentation, we developed a Riptide version that was a significant improvement over Optide, up to 87% more success rate. Uh, we also worked with the Coast Guard on hoax calls. They were getting a simple mayday message from the same person over and over again. All that he said was mayday, mayday. And they wanted to know whether voice forensics would help us figure out who that person was. So voice forensics is heavily influenced by AI and machine learning. Uh, the caller's voice is like a digital foot fingerprint. And I was absolutely blown away when my colleagues at Carnegie Mellon listened to these recordings and all they said was mayday, mayday, mayday. And they said, well, this is a person who's about 35 years old. Uh, he's a, a Native American speaker. Uh, he's about five foot 10 and weighs about 170 pounds. And by the way, he's calling from a warehouse where is this kind of a fan going in the background. Remarkable. And all because we know how to understand the digital fingerprint of a voice recording. And by the way, they did catch this hoax caller as a result. So in disaster preparedness and emergency response, uh, we've been uh, discovering, again, using machine learning, that people follow typical sequences when they communicate in an emergency situation. And we've used the social media that came out of the Haitian earthquake of 2010 to study uh, the top requests for help and use machine learning to identify those and then group them by uh, uh, geolocation and figure out where and what kind of help they most needed. Uh, so my work with Cicada has got me to crazy places, whether it's the 50 yard line at MetLife Stadium or the Day of Game Command Center at Yankee Stadium and City Field. It's got me out on a Coast Guard boat under the Golden Gate Bridge. It's gotten me to meet the commander of the Coast Guard, the commandant of the Coast Guard, uh, and so on. Uh, so uh, it, it, it's, been an, uh, it's been an exciting trip. Now let me get into some more details now. And I'm starting with stadium security and large venue security. So if you go to the DHS website, uh, they have an Office of Safety Act implementation. Uh, the Safety Act offers uh, liability protection for products of one sort or another that will protect you against terrorist attacks. Uh, if you are vetted by the Safety Act, then the government will help you if you ever have a terrorist event and you are sued, for example. So through the Office of Safety Act implementation, they started to uh, vet large venues like Major League Baseball stadiums and National Football League stadiums and National Basketball Association arenas and so on. And they asked us to produce a document called Best Practices Resource Guide for large venues, stadiums uh, in particular. That resource guide is, uh, you can find it on the DHS Office of Safety Act implementation website. It's been widely used by many stadiums. Uh, we did three such guides, all three are there. The last one had to do with economics of security and randomization and looked at randomized designs for doing inspections. Uh, and how to practically implement them. We did a lot of work with walk through metal detectors, the kind that you're used to now if you go to a, a concert or a sports event. 
uh, or in other parts of the world, even to a restaurant or to a, a um, department store. So we helped stadiums decide uh, how many walk-through metal detectors they might need by doing some simulation modeling. But we also studied how they work in real settings uh, very differently than they work in the lab and found that the performance varies with the weather, the location, the vibration, et cetera. Uh, and we studied them with uh, walk-through metal detectors that MetLife Stadium gave us and the Rutgers police gave us. And as I said, uh, they're not, the standards for them are not written the way that they are actually used in the field. So when we visited the manufacturer of these, we found how robots are used to uh, see how they perform. And we learned about how uh, machine learning is used to develop the best versions of these, the ones that are used in prisons, where machine learning actually allows us to identify which prisoner is going through after they've been through a bunch of times. Well, the next generation of crowd screening tools is going to be using AI and machine learning heavily to speed the throughput. And it will uh, give the venue security teams ways to adjust their screening settings and to decide who gets assigned to screen where and so on and so forth, based on the evidence and what they've learned about how things work and learned about the clientele and so on. They've also talked about moving the ticket scanning before the screening so you can take advantage of information about who is coming into the venue. So on the bottom left is the evolved technology screening system that's already been adopted by Six Flags amusement uh, parks. And on the bottom right is the Patriot One system. Uh, both of them are under development. I think the jury is still out on how well they work, but this is the next generation and it fits with what the Department of Homeland Security has set as its futuristic goal, which is screening at speed. So if you go up and show up at the airport, by the time you are there, they will know enough about you that screening can be unobtrusive. Very few people will have to go through uh, the metal detectors and very few will have to have their bags screened because we'll know enough. <laughs> now that's a little scary and it makes me worry a little bit about privacy, but that is the ultimate goal. Ultimate goal is we'll also be able to tell whether uh, your bag should be screened and how much, and you should be screened and how much. And maybe it's safer to separate your bag from you and send your bag on a different plane. And maybe it's been more, it's safer to put you on a different plane than the one you were uh, scheduled to be on because they may be have a, an air marshal on that plane, who knows? A little scary, but that is futuristic. Uh, you've already heard a little bit about the world's busiest bus terminal, the Port Authority bus terminal in New York and the work we did there. A simulation of crowd movement based on learning the crowd behavior from lots of observations. We were delighted to collaborate both with City College and the Borough of Manhattan Community College on the large project that was aimed at evaluating surveillance and inspection strategies and developing evacuation scenarios and helping to redesign the terminal to be safer. So as I said, there's the new DHS Center of Excellence called Sentry that was just created in the fall of 2021. It is concerned with protection of soft targets and crowded places, that is schools and uh, places of worship. And they're visited by millions of people every day. So the basic theme of the new center is that you can't protect everything with human beings because human beings aren't fast enough to respond to threats. So some sort of automated responses are going to be important. Intelligent machines are going to be needed. And I think we all have a role to play uh, as we combine both the design of new facilities with the redesign of old ones and the combination of using intelligence data 
with sensor data and other kinds. The Rutgers has a living lab uh, and in particular is going to be experimenting with dynamic digital twins, which are models of a facility that you can then work with in simulate in the lab. So Sentry is the new kid on the block. So let me turn to supply chains for a minute. Of course, you may remember two years ago when COVID hit, we were faced with shortages of personal protective equipment like masks and gowns and ventilators. And the store shelves were empty and we couldn't get hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes or even toilet paper. And there were shortages of food for a while and yet farmers were burying crops and pouring out milk at the same time. And so our supply chains were quickly thrown into chaotic situations. And then last fall, we started seeing a repeat of so many things. Again, empty store shelves, long uh, delays at ports, backlogs of containers waiting to be unpacked, chip shortages that are, are still affecting the manufacture of everything from cars to phones. So how did all this happen? There were lots of factors. There were labor shortages. There were chip plant shutdowns. There was the continuing impact of COVID. And of course, there were major change in spending patterns because people were spending now, when they finally got out of lockdowns and quarantines, more on goods than on services. So supply, today's modern supply chains are data-driven. They have been dramatically changed in the digital age. AI and machine learning have played a major role in allowing us to minimize inventories and allow, because we know so much about expected demand for goods or components, that we can arrange just-in-time delivery and we don't have to pay more for things that we're not going to use or pay more for things that we're just going to store on the shelf. That works very well until you have a black swan event, an anomalous event that was totally unexpected. And that was COVID. So we've been forced to rethink just in time delivery and AI driven supply chains. So I, I should emphasize that AI machine learning may be part of the problem, but it's also part of the solution will allow us to track transactions, get rapid warning of changes uh, and so on. And I should also point out, we ran into trouble because supply chains are not always easily changeable. Uh, why did farmers plow under food and pour out milk? Because there was inflexibility. There were contracts in place. You couldn't very well change if you were used to delivering 25 kilogram bags of potatoes to institutions like schools and restaurants, they closed down. You can't suddenly take all your potatoes and putting it in, into two kilogram bags and deliver them to consumers. It doesn't work that way. Uh, I should quote Dan Gernstein, the former undersecretary for Homeland Security, uh, who said that we need to treat supply chains as a national security issue and develop a strategic national supply chain approach. And he was particularly concerned about the just-in-time delivery systems. He called for the development of a methodology that would establish and validate the algorithms that guide supply chains. And for the use of machine learning and robotics to help us develop new supply chain strategies to improve situational awareness and so on. Lots of stuff that we can do with AI and machine learning when it comes to supply chain. So I wanna talk about a couple of examples of supply chain projects that we've been involved in and supply chain issues of importance. Uh, information and communications technology is critical to our lives 
that runs our laptops and our smartphones, the servers running our power grid and our financial transactions and so on. Uh, but uh, there's a huge problem with cyber attacks and ransomware, and in particular with counterfeit components that might be introduced early but not discovered very fast. And AI and machine learning has a real crucial role to play here in the detection of counterfeit parts. Uh, CISA is the DHS Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency. They're heavily involved with supply chains. They have a national risk management center and uh, they have a number of working groups on supply chains that are part of the National Risk Management Center. You can find their reports online, but I would ask, can we tell which threats to the supply chain present the greatest risk and which countermeasures are most effective at reducing the risk from disruptions? So we recently completed a Cicada project on development of a risk-based methodology that will allow us to make quantitative comparisons of the relative risk of different information and communications technology supply chain threats. Uh, we want to take a look and see whether the relative risk reduction of one countermeasure is better than the relative risk reduction of another. Uh, so, uh, to be concrete here, uh, we looked at a, uh, a little example of a, a scenario, a made up a scenario with uh, a company that was uh, getting counterfeit high performance differential pressure transmitters to use to measure liquid gas or steam pressure. And then we looked and asked ourselves, whether certain countermeasures against those, those, the threats of counterfeit were better than others, like using technologies to trace transactions, would it reduce risk more than setting up product inspection and performance spot testing processes with customers? And we looked to see whether advanced techniques using machine learning could detect counterfeit packaging and labeling, uh, would they reduce risk more than placing engineers in the vendor's location on a regular basis? And we developed uh, and studied a number of different countermeasures against counterfeit goods. We did a simulation for performance of the supply chain under different countermeasures. I won't get into the details, but we looked at three types of countermeasures, for example, that had to do with uh, selecting a certain percentage of incoming parts to compare to uh, databases that have been set up by the Department of Defense and at the private sector. Uh, a second countermeasure that did that, was also, but also triggered increased inspection detection when you were getting more counterfeit parts. And another that did both those things would also increase production capacity to compensate for the increased inspection and detection. And our, uh, our simulations told us which of them did better in terms of protecting against counterfeit. So uh, a key in protecting against disruptions of the supply chain, whether it's counterfeit goods or other things, is to get early warning. And so AI and, and machine learning has a major role to detect anomalies in the values of different indicators and warnings. So we have another supply chain project that is already underway, dealing with the pharmaceutical supply chain and working closely with the fraud units at uh, in the private sector at Merck and Johnson and Johnson and other places, as well as DHS, uh, where we've built detailed models of pharmaceutical supply chains and detailed models of criminal organization capabilities to attack those supply chains. And the development of indicators and warnings that would tell us that an attack was planned or underway. And I won't go through the details of this, but we've built a large model of all the different places 
in a supply chain where a criminal organization might attack it. Uh, I just should point out that in pharmaceuticals, the ingredients found in counterfeit medicines are really problematic, whether it's roach powder or brick dust or lead or talc or whatever. Uh, obviously dangerous, but uh, the packaging is one line of approach that might help us because if we can tell whether a package is fraudulent or even the labeling on a pill is fraudulent, then we might be able to detect counterfeit early. And by looking at things like the print quality and the difference in font style and the correct colors in the artwork, we might be able to use machine learning to be able to spot irregularities in packaging and labeling. And we're already starting to do that. So here you have uh, two versions of the same pill. The packaging on the left is wrong because it's the wrong shade. And there's no print on the capsule body as there should be. And the fonts are different if you look really carefully. Uh, the next project I want to tell you about is uh, disruptions to the marine transportation system. Uh, because uh, if you may remember a year ago or so, the Ever Given was a big container ship that got grounded in the Suez Canal. Because its grounding took place in the context of another disruption, namely COVID, it got much worse. And now this other project we've started has to do with co connecting multiple inter uh, connected disruptions and see how we can best prepare for them. Whether it's a cyber attack at the same time that there's an oil spill or a container ship getting uh, blocked in the entrance to New York Harbor, uh, at the same time that there's a labor strike and we can't get people out there to fix it. Those are the kinds of things that there hasn't been much work done about. So one way of solving supply chain challenges is to create stockpiles. We already have a national stockpile for medicines. We ask whether companies should have stockpiles. We ask whether other government agencies should have stockpiles. And there are a lot of interesting questions about stockpiles, like whether AI and machine learning can guide us in deciding when to restock them, or how best to uh, understand uh, where different things are in the stockpiles and how best to share information about those things. So let me close by talking about the preparedness for disasters and response to disasters. We, even just natural disasters, they are everywhere. Whether it's epidemics or earthquakes or floods or wildfires or tsunamis or oil spills, certainly machine learning, uh, uh, AI and machine learning more generally can help us in monitoring and responding to such events and mitigating their effects. So I'd like to just uh, mention a number of the ways in which intelligent machines are already being used in disaster management. Uh, robots go into dangerous situations like earthquake rubble or radioactive environments where you wouldn't want to send people. They clear the debris. They detonate bombs that they find. They deliver medical supplies uh, when you wouldn't want people to go into areas of contagion. Uh, they are already being used in drones that are used for situational awareness and law enforcement uh, or surveillance for social distancing and mask wearing as they've done in some places during the COVID. And they deliver supplies to law enforcement uh, and food. And they clear debris and they fight fires and so on and so forth. So it's not totally new. Those of you who may remember the nuclear disaster in Chernobyl, which was part of Russia then, radiation was too high for humans to enter. This happens to be an early uh, robot that was sent in to the uh, Chernobyl area 
when humans couldn't work more than 40 seconds at a time because of radiation. But even those robots uh, were unable to do very well because radiation destroyed a lot of their electronic parts. Okay, oil spills. Uh, certainly the Arctic is an area of particular sensitivity when it comes to uh, the environment, but also uh, because uh, they don't have a lot of in infrastructure in case there is an accident. Um, as we faced increasing offshore oil drilling in the Arctic, we took on a, a cicada research project to try to understand how to allocate resources in advance in case of an oil spill. Uh, we built a large optimization model with more than 2 million variables, almost 2 million variables, algorithmic approaches to solve that model and get, give some guidance as to about what kinds of equipment you need to store where. But intelligent machines could certainly help with oil spills too. And I mentioned that MIT's uh, uh, lab called Sensible, Sensible City has created already a prototype robot for a system called Sea Swarm that would be a fleet of vehicles that could make cleaning up future oil spills more efficient than current methods. And let me close with flood mitigation. We worked with FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, on information-driven tools to make investment decisions. What kinds of things should you do have the biggest impact on responding to and preventing floods. And we use data from the Raritan River around the, uh, Rutgers. And we looked at precipitation level and river gauge level and flood maps and property damage payouts. And also the soil conditions and the ground cover. And we built uh, hydrological models, meteorological models, economic models, and we put them all together to develop a tool for helping us make better flood mitigation investment decisions. And I would argue that building such tools in the future would require us and be benefit us if we build on the massive amounts of data available and use machine learning to predict the usefulness of different strategies. So I could go on and on. Uh, I've already gone longer than I wanted to. Uh, I wanted to leave time for questions, and I, and I will. But I just mentioned that other ways that AI and machine learning is already beginning to be used or could be involved, for example, to control the spread of disease. Uh, Microsoft Earth involves uh, use of intelligent machines to identify and capture disease-carrying mosquitoes. Uh, the Coast Guard has the first line of defense against invasive species. We're already seeing robots being designed to identify invasive lionfish and to capture them and destroy them, as an example. We're seeing robot screeners at border crossings already under test in the European Union. Uh, we're uh, beginning to use AI and ML to find anomalies in the data that Customs and Border Protection gets about what goods are in a shipping container. Uh, AI and ML also being used to get early identification of candidates who might be uh, looking to uh, perform an act of violent extremism or school shooting. We're using it in predictive policing, identifying areas where to police. Uh, we also have now hundreds of hours of footage from body cameras that we could learn to de-escalate conflict situations with police using appropriate AI tools. And of course, a big problem we all face is disinformation. And hopefully, in it being able to counter disinformation, AI machine learning will also help us. So I've covered a lot of ground. Uh, I, as I said, I could go on and on, but let me turn this over to questions. Excellent. Thank you, Fred, for this all this uh, eye-opening, you know, experience for different applications. So we have, we do have a few questions. Uh, so Jin, could you share the screen so you can start to ask questions? 
for those yeah. who still have questions, you can put it in the chat so we can be more efficient. You may zoom up the window a little bit. Uh, to, uh, you mean zoom in? Uh, no, yeah, it's 150, maybe 150. It's just okay. there. Cool. All right. So let's start with our first question yeah, will be uh, it's, getting, it's getting smaller on the screen. Maybe it's 100, 200, and maybe more. Is yeah. that good? Right. Okay, cool. Uh, can be bigger, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest we can go. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, cool. go ahead. All right, so the first question is, what are the qualifications to work on the project for the defense, security, and the intelligent applications? Oh, so it depends on the projects, of course. Um, I would have to say that, um, first of all, just learning how to um, work in a team is a very big deal because the pro kind of problems that I've talked about today and many others are multidisciplinary in nature. So they don't just involve computer science. They don't just involve mathematics and they don't just involve statistics. They involve uh, uh, law. They involve um, political science. Uh, they involve ethics. And so you need to learn how to work with people of a different discipline than yours. I was lucky and I did this when I, if you remember, I went to uh, do a postdoctoral stint in a psychology department, even though I had a mathematics degree. Uh, that's an early example of what I have in mind. Uh, so multidisciplinarity, don't limit yourself to one narrow discipline. Other than that, be a good communicator, uh, develop some technical skills. Certainly comfort with technology is gonna be important. Uh, and uh, dedicate yourself to being a good student. Great. And thank you for the answer. The second one will be, uh, what is the most important training for an undergrad student and then a graduate student to work in the field? So I don't think I can give that as a single most important training answer. I think uh, we need people with all kinds of backgrounds. We need people with uh, language skills. Uh, we need people with computer skills. We also need people to understand the social sciences. Behavioral science is gonna be an important piece. So when you come to uh, a large mall, you are under, or when you come to a baseball game, before you get into the stadium, you're under observation by people who are experts in behavior and looking for cues that you might be nervous or you might be doing something that isn't proper. Uh, and for that matter, I mentioned the, uh, the, the European Union and testing robots at the borders. Robots are being trained to look for behavioral cues, uh, which would then stop somebody and turn them over to a human being to interview them further. But uh, so we need behavioral scientists, we need uh, language speakers who speak and write and understand different language. We need computer scientists uh, and mathematicians. We need engineers, we need lawyers. So just do something that you're, you will, will prepare you for some specialty, but at the same time, as I said, breadth as well as depth. Right. I think this uh, the third question will be more like a follow up question. What skill would you think would be more important, the math skill, program skill, critical thinking, or communication? Well, I think communication skills is part of everything, uh, but and critical thinking is part of everything, uh, and programming skills, pretty important as well. I, I wouldn't say any of them is. I wouldn't want you to say just concentrate on one because you need to be good at a lot of things. Right. And the follow-up will be, uh, what are your suggestions for those who do not have a diverse background as you have, 
but still want to work on the problem that will need a cross discipline knowledge and uh, collaborations? Well, I think it's being open-minded. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's try to get that diverse background if you can. Uh, I love to see people who have multi double majors uh, or minors, but there are also certificate programs that you can go back for uh, that only require two or three courses with a specialization. Um, those are worth looking at. And keep yourself, this world is changing really fast. So I mentioned the federal law enforcement training centers and the training they're doing uh, with uh, law enforcement from all over the country uh, on digital forensics. Uh, that's because the, the field is changing so rapidly that uh, you have to keep up. And so, uh, it's taking uh, an interest in new topics, reading a lot, but also taking advantage of training courses and things of that sort. Okay. Uh, thank you for the instruction. And next one is uh, the Scala 3301 puzzle relate to the Scala in any way? I don't really know what the Cicada 3301 puzzles are. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure they don't relate to Cicada. But cicadas, cicadas do. Uh, the cicadas are very smart. They share information. Uh, they analyze things. Uh, and uh, we try to do that in cicada as well, so. <laughs> Great. And next one is that you have mentioned those uh, different criminal code per state. Uh, why do you think there is no like a standardized code? Well, you know, the United States uh, is a um, is built on individual states that can have their own laws and their own rules, and uh, we see this with traffic rules. We see this with under, you know uh, the way schools work, and so on and so forth. Uh, it's just the way the U.S. is built. Great. Uh, next one: uh, Can security system be built into the intelligent AI? to prevent people from hacking them or when the usual activity was detected? Well, uh, yes, I, of course. The, it, it's a goal. So it, I think this is a constant battle to improve our computer systems so that uh, we uh, can protect them from the hacking that criminal organizations and nation states and other bad actors uh, and try to inflict upon them. Uh, this is, we need more and more people who are capable of doing this. And so if you wanna know a specialty to go into, certainly cybersecurity is a key piece. And from uh, one of the audience, one of their concern is that the big data and data trick down the local law enforcement and the local and the law enforcement agency don't have the data and the data to ensure that their data is not being manipulated by the hackers. Do you have a concern that law enforcement might be subject to the national security concern based on lack of the data analyzed? So that's a, that has several pieces to the concern here. Uh, absolutely, the small local enforcement does not have the resources to train people. Uh, it doesn't have the resources to do the data analysis and the data gathering and so on that larger uh, agencies do. That's one reason that I talked about information sharing and the importance of information sharing. Uh, the information sharing environments that allow different law enforcement agencies to share information is absolutely critical. But it's not just law enforcement. So uh, I mentioned our interest in maritime cybersecurity. So the the so different industries uh, are further along in uh, cybersecurity than others. Uh, the healthcare. Uh, sector 
and the financial sector and the automotive sector, they are very far along and have a lot of expertise. The maritime sector is not. And that's because there are a lot of very small players and very small companies that can't afford to hire specialists in cybersecurity. And so uh, they are the ones who are vulnerable. And sometimes all you have to do is attack a small component of a system. And even with the big companies, as we move more and more to uh, autonomous vehicles or semi-autonomous vehicles, uh, the world's biggest container ship is 400 meters long. And uh, imagine that. And it's got room for tens of thousands of containers. And yet, because it's so fully automated, it can run with a crew of six people, half of whom are sleeping at one time or another. Now, why can it do that? In part, because the, the ship is uh, managed and controlled from company headquarters and from the computers at company headquarters. Now, that's a potential weak link because company headquarters may be small and may not have a lot of real expertise. And all of a sudden, uh, you've got an organization, a criminal organization, hacking into the big 400 meter long container ship out on the open ocean because they could hack into a, the company headquarters computer. So, and the same thing with law enforcement. So yes, there's great concern that law enforcement doesn't have the tools, doesn't have the skills, doesn't have the ability, and doesn't have the budget to hire people or to train them. Great, thank you. And thank you for providing that example. Uh, so next, what happened if the sentry machine are hacked? So we're talking about the sentry machines from the new center that we're talking about? Yeah, I uh, believe so. Yeah, so, you know, what happens to any security device that might be hacked? Uh, it, it can happen. And the trouble, the thing is that we have to be sure to see if we can detect the hacking or the counterfeiting uh, or whatever as quickly as possible. And that's where you get into projects like the one I mentioned about indicators and warnings about anomalies. Um, I mentioned, for example, the power grid. Uh, the power grid is uh, was developed very uh, haphazardly without a lot of planning. It's not like you built the, the power grid from scratch with good engineering principles, as opposed to something like Sentry. Um, it just was built. And uh, now, we get so much data about the health and status of the power grid that human beings can't keep up with that data. So we used to get about every 10 seconds, a report of how, of the a variety of parameters that tell you about the connectivity and the health of the different components of the grid. If something goes wrong, and you want to avoid a major blackout because a component in one part of the grid is connected to so many other components, uh, you have to detect that anomaly rapidly. Now, I said it used to get updated every 10 seconds. Now it gets updated 10 times a second. So that's several orders of magnitude faster and it's so fast that a human being can't possibly comprehend that there's an anomaly. So we need a machine that is an anomaly detector and supercomputers are being trained to do that so that they can not only detect an anomaly, but take uh, corrective action in a hurry. Great, and thank you for that. Uh, regarding the tracing and the general civilians, how much does the zero knowledge proof factors and how can AI mitigate the bias in the random search? 
uh, bias is a major issue. Uh, and sometimes bias uh, enters in in subtle ways. Uh, and I think, I think this is an educational problem to some extent that we who, who teach the basics of engineering and the basics of computer science need to emphasize ethics and fairness and prevention of bias and privacy and things of that sort from the very early stages that you learn how to build an algorithm. Uh, we need to make sure that the, uh, the fairness and the lack of bias is as important a measure of how good your algorithm is as is its speed and ease of use and so on. Great. Uh, next question is, what about the counterfeit medicine that is not cosmetically indispensable? It's a big problem, right? You have to find different ways of, of figuring out whether a medicine is counterfeit. Uh, it's not just the, um, the uh, looking at the appearance, it's tracing where, where it's being sold, mm -hmm. whether it's from a company that you haven't heard of, whether uh, that, uh, that company has any history of misbehavior or counterfeits uh, and so on and so forth. But it, there, there are a lot of things you have to look at, but you as a consumer are not gonna be able to do that very well. It's agencies that are monitoring the, uh, the medicines and it's agencies that are uh, tracking and tracing all of the transactions that go from uh, one stage of the supply chain to another. Cool. I think just a follow-up question is to identify the counterfeit, like what kind of data have been used to train the AI or the machine learning? Yeah, so I mentioned some examples from uh, pharmaceuticals, right? So mm -hmm. it's the font, uh, it's the color, uh, it's the, uh, uh, the variety of designs, it's subtle things in the design uh, and so on. It's, it's the shape, it's the size. And uh, we have to look at all kinds of data to see which ones work best. But um, those are just some of the examples. Sounds good. And are you involved well, I in- I also the mentioned, by, so um, I mentioned when we looked at information and communication technology, mm -hmm. uh, there are large databases now. Uh, there is one called GDEP, G-I-D-E-P. It, uh, it is um, a global information database that is maintained by the Department of Defense. And there's a private company called ERAI, it has a huge database of counterfeit goods and counterfeit materials. And so one of the first things you, you would do would be you would consult those databases to see uh, how you can train uh, your, you know, your uh, algorithm to do better. Great, and thank you for providing that example. Uh, are you involved in developing the AI to help disrupt territory in a highly contest area? Uh, I would say no, uh, that's a simple answer. Gotcha. And next one, uh, what are the typical lagging in our current curriculum of the data science degree and the training program? Oh boy. Well, I mentioned what I thought was very important uh, and that was training in ethics and uh, bias and privacy and things of that sort. I think that's one of the key things. Uh, but I also would re-mention the importance of uh, multidisciplinarity and making sure that you understand that uh, there are issues other than technology when it comes to uh, data science. Uh, so, for instance, at the at West Point, when they train people in their cybersecurity major, 
The first course is a computer science course. The second course is a political science course. And so that multidisciplinarity is, is being recognized in some places, but it typically I don't think it's there uh, in data science yet. Well, great. So, Jim, thank you, Jim. Thank you, Fred. This, uh, I think this is a very good point, place to start, right? About the, how we, you know, calibrate our curriculum for data science training. But I do have a last question from the audience. Uh, so they, they ask, the, uh, yeah, let me share it here. Let's use like a three minutes because we are running out of time. So one question about the, uh, the ticket first, you know, I have a couple of time type on here. Uh, sorry. Let me, let me post it up so it makes it easier. So the question is about the uh, screening. So the, the, the person asked the question, he said that he very like the idea of moving ticket scanning first. But there's one problem. He said that the person used to be a very good person, no record, no nothing. But uh, you know, just happened. Uh, he he, well, he watched the movies. This uh, you know, posting here that they are changed. So how how do we deal with that? Because the thing that the first screen saying that he's good, we may pay a little attention to him, but then he is very dangerous. I, I I don't think you know with this I can solve the problem. But uh, probably Fred can offer some insight on this. Well, it's a perfectly good question, right? Uh, your your um, analysis is only as good as your as as your data, and yes, things change. But I would like to think that things change gradually, uh, yeah. and that uh, you would pick up such changes. But yes, we need to use every possible source of data. the 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 movie ticket scanning in advance uh, is only one piece of it, right? It's yeah. it's any information. Look, I don't. I think I, I'm. You know, we're all concerned with privacy, and but we have basically sold our souls to being able to communicate now over the internet. And there's very little about each of us that's not known by somebody. Uh, exactly. Yeah. You know, whether what kind of pizza we like, uh, what our waistline size is, what our cholesterol level is. Uh, yeah. So you can find that out, yeah, right? whenever so, you go online, the information is collected. So right. they, you, you read this, you do this, you purchase that, right? So they almost know you better than yourself. Exactly. So yes, it's a concern that your information may not be up to date, but uh, boy, you have, to, you, you have to use as much in the way of different sources of information as possible. You don't want to depend just on one kind. Uh, with this, I think I have to stop here. I have another meeting. I have to go there. I really rush down there. We have the last, uh, it's not a question. We really thank uh, Fred very much for the very informative talk, eye opening, very insightful for both AI, machine learning, as well as data analytics. And all this very important the everyday life applications, you know, it's really close to us. So, with this, we all thank Fred for. Uh, spending time with us. We hope we can have the dialogue, uh, you know, more uh, after this. Thank you, Fred. It was my pleasure. Yeah. Great. Thanks, everyone, for attending.